The concepts of nothingness and silence have always intrigued me. And thanks to Getty Images, I can start this video off with an attention-grabbing visual. For the past year, I have been conducting research for an art history senior thesis. Thanks to a couple of grants, I was able to travel across the country to different museums in the summer of 2017 to see all kinds of 20th century American art. This is me during a visit to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. In particular, I have been interested in the artist Robert Rauschenberg and composer John Cage, whose avant-garde collaborations changed the course of post-World War II art. Their engagement with monochrome painting, silent music, phenomenology, and Zen Buddhist philosophy can seem both fascinating and enigmatic at the same time, and I think that uncertainty was probably the whole point. Some of the art I'm going to talk about might seem absurd, but it is okay to laugh. Both Rauschenberg and Cage reveled in the anarchy of free play in their art, welcoming laughter. My senior thesis is somewhat facetiously titled Nothingness. What I want to investigate with my research is the story of how nothingness functions as the heart and soul of certain artworks in early 1950s America. While this phenomenon may seem oxymoronic at first, my argument is that there is a new compositional and theoretical framework through which Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings, created in 1951, can be understood. His white paintings, the three-panel version is pictured here, are the origin of the thesis. Nothingness can be manipulated, bracketed, and staged. Essentially, this entire investigation is an experiment with that plays with the limits of perception, seeing what happens to the classic art historical method of close looking when there is nothing to see. The white paintings have a convoluted physical history. Most people consider them on block instead of as separate and distinct objects. While this is understandable due to their identically blank surfaces, I would like to call attention to their physical existence that they are more than just an idea that was never executed. Throughout the years, multiple versions of the white paintings have appeared and been destroyed. Each painting was periodically updated with a fresh coat of latex house paint to keep the surface pristine and bereft of any marks of either the artist's hand or the historical accumulation of dust. Interestingly, Rauschenberg once said that he wanted the paintings to look as if they were not painted. Officially, there are five extant white paintings, a one-panel, two-panel, three, four, and seven panel version. Notice how he skips five and six. The immediate critical response when he first exhibited them was overwhelmingly negative. It took the voice of his good friend, John Cage, in 1961 to provide the positive conceptual framework through which they can be understood. Cage famously characterized them as, quote, airports for the lights, shadows, and particles of the surrounding environment and this off-quoted interpretation has dominated the discourse ever since. Cage implies that by directing the viewer's gaze toward the artwork, your senses will open up to perceive things such as the time of day, shadows, or the floating dust in the room. Rauschenberg and Cage's collective interest in sensory deprivation in the early 1950s culminated in the anechoic chamber, linking together the visual and the auditory. An anechoic chamber is a meticulously engineered room that eliminates all echoes, e external sounds, and vibrations. It is only in this lab acoustic laboratory setting that one can experience complete silence. Urban legends suggest that staying in an anechoic chamber can make people become disoriented and even go crazy, but Cage and I have both tried it and enjoyed it. Staying in one was a transformative experience. In the chamber, there is no light to see by, and depending on your body's health, possibly no sound to hear. Cage's silent piece, 433, was a direct response to both the Anico chamber and Rauschenberg's white paintings. At the 1952 premiere of 433, a pianist sat up on stage in front of a piano and sat in silence for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. As you can see in the score here, which is in proportional notation, Cage delineates each of the three movements with a vertical line. It looks sort of similar to the gaps in Rauschenberg's paintings. 
Clearly the score is not, a, is not simply a void of undifferentiated nothingness. It is nothingness divided into sections of length. Rauschenberg once said that painting relates to both art and life. Neither can be made. I try to act in the gap between the two. An answer to the question of how the white paintings work lies in the gaps between the panels. If there truly is nothing in the center of these panels, perhaps we can direct our attention to their edges and gaps that teeter on the fence between art and life. And these gaps are the deciding factors that dictate the differences between each white panel or white painting version. Rauschenberg's deliberate use of the gap begins to make sense within this framework. The one panel painting is simply a void, but by increasing the amount of gaps, he emphasizes that the content of nothingness can be staged by structure. The viewer can experience the same void in different ways depending on its size or to what extent meta-perception or perception of one's own perception is naturalized in the structure of each painting. A gap makes the viewer aware of the act of looking, that he or she is not looking at the nothingness itself, but the gap in between the nothingness. Indeed, Rauschenberg gradually adds gaps by adding panels until he arrives at the four-panel version, at which point he conspicuously skips the five- and six-panel versions. Rauschenberg makes this omission blatant by creating a seven-panel version, pictured here behind the artist, which functions as a hyper-bracketed painting that forces the eye to attend to all six gaps, not, ex not counting the exterior edges. Gaps were, are traditionally seen as parts of art that should not be looked at, that are not the focus. But that is not true in this case. Furthermore, the gaps reinforce the imperfections of Rauschenberg's materials. The more gaps, the easier it is to see that the literal structure of the paintings are not geometrically perfect. The wood warps over time, dirt sullies the purity of the white surfaces, each panel does not line up precisely when you see it in person, with some sticking out from the wall more than others. These imperfections become exponentially mo more noticeable the more panels there are. The seven-panel painting symbolically represents the inevitable per imperfection of worldly materials. Perhaps the problem of material imperfection ends up being less of a problem to be minimized by exhibition organizers and more of an interesting feature. So, this has been just a small preview of my research project, everything I could cram in into a small video. I hope you found it to be informative and interesting. Let me know if you'd like to learn more, and thanks for listening.